Welcome to this week on History Chat. Our speakers are Tabitha Stanmore and Henry Marsh. Their topic is Magic in Chronicles. Hello, I'm Henry Marsh. I studied the English Latinate Chroniclers between 1377 and 1422, and I'm studying at the University of Exeter, co-supervised at the University of Bristol, and funded by the SWWDTP. Thank you, Henry. Hello, I'm Tabitha. I am studying my PhD as well, but at the University of Bristol as my main institution and Exeter as my secondary, where I am researching magic and popular culture, largely in medieval and early modern England. Partly looking at chronicles, which is where we overlap, partly looking at various other types of source, so court records, diaries, other forms of popular culture that we might be able to find, so plays and stories and ballads and that kind of thing. Right. Yes. Well, <laughs> hello. <laughs> Could you perhaps explain to us a little bit more what magic means for you in this document, how you define it? Yes, absolutely. So I think that that's a very good question and something that I think we often stumble on. As historians, there are many different types of magic out there and many definitions for magic. So the one that I tend to go for is a ritual practice which is performed to perform an outcome which wouldn't normally be possible by human agency. So that's quite broad. I try to apply that to medieval or early modern understanding. So for example, science is not exactly as we understand it now, but there were still ideas of cause and effect and natural impact. So something that we would perceive as magical, so carrying a gemstone for example for good luck, isn't necessarily magical in the medieval period, but equally a prayer or a corrupted prayer could be could well be a form of magic because it's using something which human well verbalizing something shouldn't be enough to make something happen for example you can't force somebody to die or fall in love or something like that just by muttering a prayer outside of their hearing but it was believed to have enough power to be able to sort of inf magic is well sort of basically by definition occult hidden impossible to define <laughs> basically which makes my research <laughs> difficult <laughs> and very interesting for that reason but no today we're talking about magic in chronicles and to start with well, before we can actually get down to that properly, we need to actually work out what a chronicle is. So, what is a chronicle, Henry? A chronicle is one of many types of historical writing which we see in the Middle Ages. They supposedly die out largely by the 16th or 17th centuries. Mm. There are a number of texts mocking the very idea of a chronicle as a rather outdated form of historical writing. But the main three categories that people discuss are annals, chronicles and histories. Now, an annal is fairly simple. It runs through the years, normally giving a very brief account of what occurred in a particular year. A history normally deals with a particular topic, a campaign or a, a person's life in a, perhaps a more secular person's life. Those can include guesters, although not always. Sometimes a guesster can be a chronicle. <laughs> it's, the line is, once again, very blurry. A chronicle, though, is usually a rather analytic history. It covers large sections of particular years in order, in chronological order, in fact, and details the various events during those years. Okay, got to say, well, two things. Firstly, it's really nice to see somebody sort of talk about chronicles in an enthusiastic way, because I've been trying to convince my students that they're cool. And uh, Chronicles are awesome. Yeah. <laughs> chronicles are fantastic. They I know are. that, but <laughs> it's nice to see. They may not be communicating to a wide audience, hmm. but they're imagining a society and a set of events, even if they haven't seen them, and recording them for whatever reason. And it varies from chronicle to chronicle. That is a very good point, though, actually. What is the audience for chronicle in general? <laughs> <laughs> Just to give you a, <laughs> a lovely broad question. <laughs> OK, I'll, I'll keep this short with a couple of examples. Mm -hmm. If we take Adam Fusk, He's a secular clerk, he's a priest, he comes from Wales, Usk in fact, you might have guessed. He studies at Oxford under the patronage of Mortimers, then works for King Henry IV, Thomas Arundel, the Archbishop of Canterbury, before moving to the continent and working for the Pope, and then the anti-Pope, and then some other lords, and back to Wales to work for a rebel lord, slash the Prince of Wales, Englandur, and 
then he goes back into the service of Henry the Fourth. The Prince of Wales, as declared um, by Wales, as opposed yes. to by the English king at the time. Sorry, so I should have back. clarified. Yep, I, <laughs> trying to include both the English point of view there and the Welsh point of view. So, for the record, the English at the time obviously regarded Oglendor as a rebel. But his audience is extremely small. Hmm. He claims not to have written it for anyone to read during his lifetime. Interesting. There's only one copy of it. It's occasionally dangerous as a text, and arguably something which would be likely to be censored, as he's not always very positive about Henry IV. Mm -hmm. And the person he leaves it to is Edward Ap Adam, one of his relatives, who I believe is supposedly his nephew. I don't know if he actually is his nephew. But that's his audience. Whereas on the other hand, you have, say, Thomas Walsingham, whose chronicle receives a wider circulation. Thomas Walsingham is a chronicler from St. Albans, one of the most prestigious Benedictine houses in the 14th century. He's again educated at Oxford, again a priest, as well as being a Benedictine monk. He is quite high in the abbey hierarchy. He's presental which is to say that he deals with the monks who are singing and their certain aspects of their education there, as well as master of the scriptorium, mm. as in the place where people write. Yeah. His chronicle has certain circulation. We know that it's read by a number of other chroniclers in other institutions. We know that he composes one version of his chronicle for Henry V himself, but that's a very select one. And apart from that, who his chronicle is actually intended for is very much guesswork. In many ways, he may have intended it for himself as much as anyone else. Mm. A personal piece of interest. His own concern with historical events is thoroughly demonstrated throughout the chronicle and throughout his other writings, all of which show an incredible level of knowledge, learning and concern with historical events in general and other mm. histories that have been written. So, I mean, obviously we should be talking about, about magic yes. at some point, but... Sorry. No, no, that was, that was really interesting. I just... It just makes me wonder sort of what the point in, man in Chronicles were in that sense, because... I mean, or they would be kept by the monastery in general, wouldn't they? So, potentially, um, or, well, monastery, abbey, you know, depending on who's writing it and where. So, potentially other readers from that institution be reading it or possibly visitors to that institution as well and of course they're also written on parchments they're actually very expensive to write so they do have a small audience it's just interesting that so much effort is put into them because they're also mm. vastly long um, and would have taken a lot of time to collect all the information and then write it down and sort of prepare the the skins that they've written on and everything so it just seems strange that that they would have such a small small audience but that's that's more of a side point <laughs> i just think i think there are a number of factors which need to be considered there. Mm. Number one, amongst orders such as the Benedictines, mm. during the 14th century there is an educational revival. There's a huge reform effort which spreads from reforms in 1277 to the Summa Magistri in 1336. And these reform efforts, plus the Benedictines' own culture, emphasises the importance of book production mm. as, in some ways, a spiritual exercise. In and of itself, it is a worthy pursuit. Mm. So, although this is very expensive, you have to consider that the monasteries, on the whole, the ones that produce chronicles, are also incredibly wealthy. Mm. If we turn to Westminster or St Albans, both important abbeys at the time, the monks there would have enjoyed, I think Barb Harvey argues, the standard of life expected for the minor gentry, the uh, sort of quite well-off gentry uh, at the very nice. least, which is the pinnacle of society, really speaking. Yes, they're not living as the great lords do, but then their abbots and priors are. Mm. They have remarkable resources. Westminster owns vast estates. Mm. Fair enough. So actually they can afford to sort of have a couple of people working on these chronicles and preparing parchment and that kind of thing, and it's not actually going to be impacting on their wealth a huge amount. They, they, are, they have the resources to do this. Absolutely. Yeah. Plus, there's an increasing trend for people to own books in this period. The monks, mm. most of the monks who are writing chronicles own several texts themselves, along with the Abbey libraries, which, although it's later, in the case of Henry Knighton, a chronicler at Leicester Abbey, his abbey, at the end of the 15th century, owned a thousand books. Oh, jealous. Yeah. And 
that's not even the the wealthiest of the libraries around. They are incredibly well off institutions, mm. and those are the, the libraries which the orders are the people inside the abbey as a whole can access. Mm. Not to mention their personal little libraries, which can include a dozen books. So <laughs> now, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> long okay. diversion, but I enjoyed it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose that does lead to where the supernatural or magic. I should say, mm. fits within a chronicle, if they're a sort of a historical text. Yes. How have you encountered them in your research? What is perhaps your methodology for dealing with <laughs> magic in chronicles? Well, I mean, that is a good question. So as I said before, there are lots of different things existing in the weird side, the sort of the non-normal side of medieval life. So when I'm looking for magic, I'm also sort of, I'm actually weeding through various different other kinds of supernatural, preternatural, um, as in sort of natural but beyond normal natural instances so in the chronicles obviously you find um, marvels you find portents you find uh, miracles random bizarre happenings that don't really seem to have any particular purpose or reason to them they're just strange and then you actually have magic as in something which is being performed deliberately by a human being to actually achieve some kind of end and those are the specific ones that I'm, I'm looking for they sort of come under many different guises sometimes it will just be a sort of a little reference to a divination for example so you know oh when when Henry the second was going into battle he actually apparently commissioned a magician to find out whether he was going to win the battle or not we know about this because <laughs> there are complaints about him doing it and there's actually sort of moralizing of no you really shouldn't have done that if you hadn't done that then maybe you would have actually won the battle but as it was you sort of asked for a magician's help and not gods so that's they come out in references to magic come out in lots of different situations for various different reasons i'm sort of yet yeah, reading through the chronicles trying to find any references i can that brings up an interesting point that mm. i wanted to raise with you when we consider people using magic mm. i tend to think of it as a universal thing there is i think there's an account in the inquisition records isn't there in southern France of someone who's in, who the Inquisition quizzed, who it turns out he claimed to have divined the future for a Pope. Mm, yes. So it's spread throughout all of society, isn't it? Yeah. So this is something which the Chronicles, which tend to deal with high politics, a mm. lot really get their teeth into. Yeah, absolutely. No, uh, the church, just using that as a generic term right now, tended to, in exemplar, which were books written to explain how a person should live and give examples for priests to use during sermons, exemplar tended to play on certain stereotypes to say that actually it's only the, the stupid or the young or women who would use magic. And it's partly a, sort of an aim to sort of shame people from not using magic but actually in reality the sources up the sources say that yeah magic was being used by everybody everywhere so as you say you did have high status individuals using it you had as I say kings commissioning it on occasion uh, several occasions has to be said <laughs> all the way down to the lowliest serf who would also be using it on a regular basis to do all sorts of things you know, partly it was to protect and heal cattle, it might be to find a lost object, it might be to get somebody to fall in love with you, and these aims and purposes are actually sort of reflected across every social stratum. This is slightly outside the Chronicles, but within my period, correct me if I'm wrong, Henry V's stepmother, Joan of Navarre, was charged with planning the king's death by witchcraft. Yes, absolutely. Witchcraft, magic, all the information I've been able to find so far is very circumspect about it basically it just sort of says Joan of Navarre was imprisoned at I think it was Leeds Castle which is actually in Kent for trying to kill the king and then another chronicle has a very brief mention of her friar also being imprisoned huh. always friars always always friars for trying to harm the king through magic but so yeah it's, it's in the Rochelieu Parliamentorum which I think is where it's recorded that Joan was actually arrested. But apart from that, there isn't actually very much information about it. It's just sort of one of these things where Joan's seen to be trying to kill her stepson. She's removed from the situation, and the fact that she used magic isn't really made a big fuss of. That is quite a good reflection of how magic seems to work in general. We tend to think of it as something which is stamped down, kept under wraps, something which was persecuted and seen as a major problem. Actually, they tend to be very vague instances, just sort of mentioned in a passing sentence, and that's all you get. My personal theory, anyway, is that it was so common and it was so much part of everyday life that, and it so much wasn't actually a major priority of the church, that these things were just sort of allowed to kind of carry on happening unnoticed or unnoted. And yet, if we take Walsingham. Mm -hmm. There's an example about 40 years earlier, mm. Walsingham, it has to be said, writes over quite a long period. He starts his original chronicle 
in 1376 and continues up until 1422. But perhaps you'd like to explain this yeah, episode yes. concerning Alice Perez. Ah, oh, Alice, Alice Perez, yes. So Alice Perez was a fascinating woman and somebody who Walsingham very much did not like, I think it's fair to say. She was the mistress of Edward III during the latter part of his life. Apparently she'd already moved into his bed before the death of his wife, which is something that Walsingham was very unhappy about. <laughs> were, um, were other chroniclers unhappy about this too, or is this a particular thing that Walsingham cared about? Unfortunately, most of them start after this point. Oh, okay. The Westminster Chronicles starts in 1381. Right. Henry Knighton starts, uh, includes that period, but it's not in as great detail as mm. Walsingham. Fair. There are a number of continuations which do deal with this subject matter, but mm. I don't think anyone has quite the level of vitriol <laughs> directed towards Alice that Walsingham demonstrates. Yes, yeah, no, I think that's absolutely fair. I think he is also the only one who mentions that she probably became the king's mistress by magic. It is interesting, you know, yeah, as you say, Walsingham, he doesn't really mention Joan of Navarre and the fact that she was actually imprisoned for magic, but she, he does have this strong idea that Alice Perez was using her friar, who she had in her employ, to create various different types of magic spells, magic rings, to gain and maintain the king's faith. So, I mean, I think Walsingham, he's, he's a really interesting chronicler in itself because occasionally he does go off and rants, I think, about <laughs> magic use. He also has quite a lot to say about Richard II and his use of, well, his ability to be manipulated through magic. And it seems to actually be a concern of Walsingham's in general that, that kings can be manipulated through hangers-on who are using magic to do that. So yeah, Edward III, Richard II, they both seem to have this sort of... It's a continual theme throughout so many chronicles, though, that whole concern of the yeah. hangers-on influencing the king, the obvious mm -hmm example is always Edward II, mm. to whom there are so many parallels drawn with Richard II, particularly because Richard II himself partially encourages them, mm. that sense of, of the spiritual rather than the warrior king. Mm. Yeah. And unfortunately, often when you get a spiritual king like Ed Edward II, like Henry III, like Richard II, not in chronological order there, <laughs> they get a rather bad uh, set of associations with their hangers-on. This is very true, but then you think of someone like Edward the Confessor, for example, who is obviously much earlier, he's sort of pre-conquest. My point is that there are kings who can be spiritually competent and militarily incompetent and still be seen in a positive light. But no, I would point that there is this risk and a fear, actually, that sort of goes back to biblical examples. A king should be strong and listen to wise counsel and not be distracted by poor counsellors. And Richard II, you know, there was this strong idea that they had a lot of very bad counsellors around him who changed his his opinions and made him a very ineffectual king. Which has to also be associated with his minority. The fact that he came to mm. the throne as a boy rather than mm. a man and spent a vast proportion of his reign, really, mm. under one form of counsel or another. That's very true. At times, enforced by his lords who said he wasn't getting good counsel. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, I guess that's also a good point, actually, but Richard II, you know, came under fire because he was a minority king to start with, and Edward III came under fire in his later years because, you know, again, he was he seemed to be too old to rule, so there's, like, this kind of medieval idea of, sort of, mental weakness correlating with age, I think, which kind of comes through, mm. which isn't pleasant, but there you go. Anyway, no, but Walsingham seems to take that one step further and include magic in this as well, which I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like a lot of people interpret Walsingham including magic in his chronicle as partly him just being incredibly catty, um, especially to Alice Perez. Um, he calls her a harlot, he calls her a, a whore, debauched, uh, turning the king to madness. That's in interesting. I mean, if I may just read out a section in English, unfortunately, <laughs> from the Chronicle. He explains, under a heading, Alice Perez, magician, is arrested and presented before Parliament. It goes as follows. In the course of these events, Parliament was informed that Alice had, over a long period of time, kept in her company a man who was a brother in the Order of Preachers, who displayed the appearance of a physician and, and professed that skill, but he was an evil magician, dedicated to evil doing, and it was by his magical devices that Alice had enticed the king into an illicit love affair with her, or to be more truthful, into that madness. For a lecherous youth sins, but a lecherous old man is insane. Mm. It was said, furthermore, 
that this brother had made wax effigies of the king and Alice, and that as once that infamous magician Nectenabus, king of Egypt, had done. I'm going to carry on reading because we've only got one book and we have to share it. <laughs> <laughs> had done. He used these with the juices of magical herbs and his words of incantation to enable Alice to get whatever she wanted from the king. He had also devised rings that caused forgetfulness or remembrance, just as Moses had once done, so that as long as the king wore them, he would never forget this harlot. Uh, I think there, for me, you have a lot of both, not only Walsingham's cattiness and capitation, but mm. also how he perceived magic. Mm. He breaks it down very much. It's mm. a series. He has the wax effigies, the rings, the antique sort of biblical comparisons mm. to previous powers, and that sort of subversion of scriptural like, examples, mm. in a sense. And it's all rolled up into sin, into the lecherousness, into the illicit affair and into his hatred of the Order of the Preachers. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he hates the Order of the Preachers. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, no, um, you're right. The, he does break it down, and he goes into a lot of detail. And partly we could say that this is, you know, just him sort of adding blame upon blame upon blame upon to his least favourite people, i.e. Perez and um, the Preachers. But also, actually, if you look at magic books that were circulating at the time, many of which were kept in monasteries, <laughs> the examples that he's using and the types of magic that he's referring to are actually ones that were being used at the time. So either he is hearing about these things happening at court and he is reporting them, or he is very aware of what magic can do and he's actually using his own knowledge to pad out a story. Either way, there is a clear reference here to magic that was very possibly being used. can't say for certain whether Perez was using it. There isn't actually any formal record of her being tried for using magic. We only really have Walsingham to, to, to sort of bolster this story that she was, you know, a magic user. But the examples that he's using, as I say, are trustworthy. They are the kind of things that people were doing. Magical herbs, his words of incantation. There are several ma magical manuscripts that actually have quite detailed incantations to encourage a person to love somebody else. Later on, in the 15th, 16th centuries, you have people commissioning magic rings to be made. Some are magic rings, like actually magic rings. Some are just rings that use particular stones. So garnets, I think, in particular, are seen as attracting luck and being very sort of positive for the wearer. And sometimes you'd have inscriptions on them. But then you also have rings that go beyond that and actually sort of bewitch a demon inside the stone that is there and conjured to make the wearer lucky. And I think from the way that this is being said, the way that he devised rings that cause forgetfulness or remembrance, that is what what seems to be happening here. That's interesting. You mentioned the use of demons mm. in this sort of magic, and of it, there are a number of other examples. Just to point to one, there's a chronicle by Thomas Favent, who's a secular clerk, not a priest. He works in London, not particularly elevated role, and he writes a very short chronicle about a series of events in 13 about the miraculous part, in which he describes basically a set of lords overthrowing the current regime under Richard II. Mm. Keeping Richard II in power, theoretically just removing his bad counsellors, <laughs> but getting rid of the various people in power that they don't like. Mm. Bit of a colour of the government. Mm. And one of them in particular, Robert Tresellian, who was a king's justice, he mentions that Tresellian claimed, while I carry a certain something around me, I am not able to die. <laughs> yes. Immediately the people who were trying to execute him, strip him, and, fa and found particular instructions with particular signs depicted in them in the manner of astronomical characters, and one depicted a demon's head. Many others were inscribed demon's names. With these taken away, he was hanged nude, and for greater certainty of his death, his throat was cut, yeah. and it became night. <laughs> <laughs> and it became night. <laughs> Probably one assumes not as a result of his throat being cut. No, presumably not. <laughs> that could just be the normal movements of the planets. Yeah, I love that case. It's really interesting. And it is, yeah, has demons involved? Magic doesn't necessarily need to involve demons. It could also involve angels, just to say. Um, it could also involve just sections of scripture. So, for example, in the beginning was the word is a very common piece of writing that you'll have that either opens a spell or is used as an actual charm in itself, protective sort of symbol. The fact that he had a demon head and demon names suggests that, essentially, these beings, who are you know, generally more powerful than humans, uh, were being conjured as 
his protection. The fact that they're demons, again, might be a moralistic thing. Um, we don't know whether that's actually what's happening. Obviously, we don't have the surviving uh, amulets that he had on him, which is a shame. That would be really fun. But yeah, the fact that they're demons could well be the Chronicler. In fairness, he was a secular Chronicler, so maybe he didn't have quite such a strong axe to grind. But it could be just saying that actually he definitely deserved to die because he was using. He wasn't just a traitor. Yep. So I should say he was a secular clerk. So uh, not a uh, rather secular Chronicler. So he was Sorry. in minor orders, mm. but not in major orders. There being a distinction. Yeah. Between the two, he also wasn't a regular chronicle in the sense that Thomas Walsingham was, as in he did not obey a religious rule such as the rule St. Benedict. Mm. He is actually a very unusual chronicle in as much as there aren't that many secular clerks who write Latin chronicles, barring Adam of Usk, who's a bizarre exception in his own way. Mm. It should also be noted that he's writing very deliberately to slander the mayor of Lo uh, slander a particular mayor of London and his party, including Tresselian and the other wicked advisers of the king, mm. because he seems to be taking side with one of the other mayors of London mm. who had a particular bone to pick, and his party had a particular bone to pick with this one. So there's strong evidence to suggest mm. that he's taking a moralistic tone here. Yes. What interests me mm -hmm. is that I can't think of very many examples in the Chronicles where magic involves other spirits, apart from generic spirits, other than demons. It either it seems to involve wicked spirits mm. at times <laughs> or demons, or nothing particularly noted. Mm. But it doesn't seem to be a positive thing, as far as I can recall. No, no. Generally, when demons are involved, it's not a positive thing. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I mean, in the chronicles, it, magic in the chronicles is not yeah. a positive activity. I would say, yeah. So generally, when there's a lot of detail around them, they are seen as is given as an example of something which is negative. The more casual examples mm. suggest that there is a more everyday use which doesn't necessarily have oh, yeah. large moralising sides you know, put into it. But no, um, we are talking about something which is technically outlawed, only enthusiastically at this point, but there is always this delicate line between natural philosophy, i.e. sort of rudimentary science, magic and heresy. And again, we should probably put heresy on that spectrum of supernatural and natural because it becomes a triangle more at that point. But there was always a concern that actually magic was being used and therefore you were circumnavigating God or going above God and then you've got idolatry involved, you've got corrupt religion and that was all very risky. So yeah, whenever you've got a chronicler referring to magic being used, it's going to, it's sort of automatically in a negative sense. But that doesn't mean that the people who were using it thought of it in a negative sense. Mm. One I would quite like to talk about actually is the way that magic is used as a protective thing. So for example, you know, you were just mentioning the demon head. What was it? There's the duel between John Annesley and Thomas Catterton. So I'm just going to read this out. So basically as Annesley enters the lists in order to take part of this duel, he swears an oath which includes, he entered the place of combat and after an oath had been sworn by his opponent, the knight, i.e. Annesley, as is the custom. He himself also swore boldly that the cause for which he was about to fight was a true one, also that he was not aware of any magic art by which he could gain victory over his opponent, nor was he wearing on, on his person any herb or stone or any kind of magical device by which evil men are accustomed to triumph over their enemies. And isn't that beautiful? I mean, <laughs> on the one hand, evil men, mm -hmm. but the routineness of that, that yeah. it's something, yeah, that's, that's your average oath before a duel. It's sort of like saying, yes, we're not taking steroids. Yeah, exactly. We're, we <laughs> promise we're not using magic here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, so on my word as a as, you know bold fighting man, I am not cheating by getting the aid of demons, <laughs> essentially, which is just, it's absolutely beautiful. And there's another example, actually, from the early stages of um, the reign of Henry IV, where the, the Duke of Orléans challenges Henry IV to a duel. Now, the Duke of Orléans is not very happy with Henry anyway, and he's trying to find any excuse. He's just itching for a fight. And so he sends Henry a letter saying, oh, congratulations on gaining the throne. Good job with that one. However, as I think that we both need to prove ourselves in arms, I think we should take a hundred of our best knights each and meet on the field of battle. Whoever wins gets all the spoils, essentially. Marvellous. Very classical. Very classical. Very, very classical. But just to sort of tempt Henry to actually you know, join this um, this battle, he says, and obviously we'll both engage in a very fair fight, which will not include any kinds of magic spells. 
And the way it's phrased, I'm sort of, I'm not quite getting through across the, the antagonism um, It's very passive-aggressive. It's very passive-aggressive and very sort of taunting, um, as if to say, oh, you'd need magic spells to beat me, and also you're the kind of person who uses those things. Yeah. Well, Henry's already told me he's overthrown a king. I mean, how much more awful and evil can you get? Well, quite. And what I love is that Henry then actually replies, we have his reply, which says, how very dare you, <laughs> essentially. And he doesn't sort of ignore the magic spell reference. He actually says, no matter what people are saying about me, I did gain my throne in, in an upright manner. I did not use any kind of supernatural aid. And frankly, I wouldn't engage in a fight with you anyway, because you don't seem like you're worth it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's so Henry. Anyway, <laughs> uh, he, he's constantly like this. Forgive me if I'm getting the incident wrong. But in Parliament, mm. when he first becomes king, he's challenged possibly by Richard II himself mm. with the accusation that he will become the Mouldywarp. Mouldywarp being Mole, and the signifier of one of the six kings of Britain in a prophecy. And the Mouldywarp, according to the prophecy of the six kings after John, mm -hmm. will be an appalling tyrant who will basically destroy the church in England. Henry's reply to this is, and I'm paraphrasing here, don't believe everything you've heard about me. It's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's... Pretty much. He's blunt to the point when it comes to saying no about these rumours. Absolutely true. But he, again, the fact that he has to engage with them and he yes. has to actually come out and say no. Not just engage. Yeah. And occasionally execute people for spreading rumours. Mm. The friars... Mm -hmm. as how the uh, Franciscans have a bit of an incident with him where he executes a whole load of them because they've been spreading rumours about Richard II mm -hmm. and as part of it, two proclamations during his reign yeah. against the promulgation of prophecies. Yes. They're banned. You're mm -hmm. not supposed to use them, which is part of the reason why Adam Vask, who loves to talk about prophecy, <laughs> has a slightly risky chronicle. That makes sense. Thank you for also clearing that up and tying up that little <laughs> <end>. <laughs> I like that. But actually, that raises something else I wanted to talk to you about. Prophecy. Prophecy. Is it magic? Oh, good question. I would tend to think no, depending on the prophecy. So some prophecies are... Well, they're, if, they're ancient, they're traditions, a lot of the time. I know some people argue that there's a difference between divine prophecy and diabolical prophecy, in a sense. A sort of yeah, I would also magic prophecy there... and divine. Yeah. Obviously, divine inspiration, the prophecy that you get in the Bible and so on. That's fine. Possibly Merlin's fine because he's sort of semi-diabolical fairyish, but he's yeah inspired by God mm -hmm. in some way. Yes, one of the many, many stories around Merlin is that actually his mother was a mortal woman, but his father was a demon. So his mother was impregnated by this demon. She ends up having a sort of half-demon child, but the first thing that she does is take Merlin to a priest who baptises him and then sort of brings him under God. So he maintains his demonic powers, i.e. the power to prophecy, see the future, manipulate nature in various different ways. But he then sort of turns his power to good. So he is this, this interesting one and it will be an entirely separate series yeah. of podcasts to talk about the history of Merlin and what's yes. actually going on with him and the various different uh, iterations of his existence. Fascinating. It, I love the hill. fascinating. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, so he's a difficult one and some of his prophecies, you could say that they're magic, you could say that they're divine. Depends when you ask, basically. A lot of prophecies, I would say, were more divine inspiration and some of those could also be sort of natural divine as well. So, for example, an eclipse ah. yeah. is not magic it might be god sending message as might be the sea boiling or something like that is god sending message where i would start saying that prophecy is magic is where you've got individuals who are trying to prophesy um, and they're not receiving their information from god they're not divinely inspired or at least they're not described as divinely inspired they're actually doing something like haruspicy as in reading the guts of an animal or looking at yeah, the way that stones sort of fall on the ground or something like that. That you could say is magic. Yeah, and I see you've put a, uh, <laughs> a section in front of me from the St Albans Chronicle, which is awesome, which is the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. And it just says, for 1385 is the year, in the month of May that year, the conjunction of the two largest planets, Jupiter and Saturn, occurred. This was followed by a great disturbance of the kingdoms, as will be revealed below when I write about this matter. 
which is a great little teaser about what's going to happen <laughs> next. I'm also going to you how to spin a tail. <laughs> he did, didn't he? He can keep you hanging on, it's great. But yeah, this was followed by a great disturbance of the kingdoms. Yes. So it's a natural event that's occurring, but it also has some kind of impact on what's going to happen on in, in the realm of men. Yeah. There are lots of different theories about this, and again, this is where we have sort of science and magic overlapping, because there was this this idea that stellar rays basically um so rays from the the planets and the sun and the sun and the stars they would come down to earth and affect human activity in this case you have a conjunction alignment of planets and something about the way that the rays are either being blocked or more are coming through that's what's causing more violence and more disruption on the, on the world. So where that starts becoming magic is that you could actually manipulate these rays. Ah. So certain stones, for example, were seen to be aligned with the planets. So you could tap into the sun's power or the, you know, Jupiter's power by doing something at certain times of day, when the sun was at its zenith or when Jupiter was in alignment with something else. And you could make stones more powerful and capture some of that magic in them and then use them. Again, it's sort of logical. If you sort of buy into the idea that these stellar rays are doing something, then actually you, it becomes a cause and effect natural manipulation as opposed to magic. But then there's the question, isn't it? At what point, or did they determine that something mm. is supernatural or natural? Mm. Accelerate ne fairly natural. It has things that you can use for supernatural purposes, mm. but it is a fairly natural event. Whereas I think prior to this, we were discussing a particular event in the St. Albans Chronicle. Mm. Just before the podcast, we were discussing a particular episode in the St. Albans Chronicle, technically the Chronica Maiora, well, seems continuation of Matthew Paris's Chronicle from the 13th century. The term St. Albans Chronicle for the sake of clarifying which one they're talking about when it comes to um, editing these texts <laughs> in large part. But Walsing writes the sum of 1403. Monsters appeared frequently during the morning and around noon near the towns of Bedford and Biggleswade, emerging from the woods, and being of various colours, like warriors encountering each other and engaging in fierce battles. Although these could be seen from a distance, they could not be discovered at all by those who approached them. And so it was that their fantastic appearance very often deceived many men who were desirous of getting close to it. This is then followed by first the Northumberland expedition to Scotland, and then the rebellion of Henry Percy, which ends with the tragic death of Henry Percy, or Harry Hotspur as he's known, mm. who Walsingham regards as a hero to the English in many ways, and despite his abhorrence towards rebels in general, he is actually quite sad about Henry Percy's death, mm. because he's been this shining light for the North for quite a while. But that, that instance seems a very odd line between natural and supernatural. Mm. It's a semi-natural event, it, it doesn't seem to have a... It's not being caused by anyone, there's no one creating this through magic, mm. but is exceptional, it's semi-miraculous. It, it doesn't appear to be within the normal realm yes. of nature. Yeah, it's definitely, it is definitely beyond the norm, and I think you're absolutely right. It's it's definitely important, isn't it? Yes. I mean, it's, it's something which saying bizarre stuff started happening, and it wasn't, it wasn't okay stuff, you know, it's monsters arriving yes. out of the woods, and that's always scary. But monsters yeah. aren't always important, are they? Not always, no. And we're going to go on to that. But um, it's, it is interesting that it, when, when bad stuff happens, often strange stuff happens before. Yes. That kind of thing. Sometimes events are less um, impressive. Adam of Ask, mm. as I've mentioned, loves portents. Mm. He has a selection of slightly odd portents, <laughs> streams flowing with blood, mm. double-headed calves, and eggs with faces on them. Well, I mean, the Virgin Mary appears in a you know, slice of toast on a regular oh, yes. basis, so yeah, I don't see why not. <laughs> Just portents turn up all over the place. <laughs> But, I mean, you're absolutely right that actually sometimes strange things happen and they're not important. They are just... Strange. Strange. Yeah, Stranger exactly. things. Yes. <laughs> Good reference. Hold on. <laughs> but no, so another section from the St. Albans Chronicle, two years later, 1405. There's a report that a dragon of immense size, with a crested head and serrated teeth, and with a tail of immense length, appeared close to the town of Bury, near Sudbury, with evil intent against the land. Now, you might think that the battle's about to start oh, or something yes. like that. Would make sense. Battle, strange events, perhaps the French absolutely, making an invasion. Absolutely, <laughs> evil intent, evil intent. Yep. This killed a shepherd and a large number of his sheep. Servants of the knight of Sir Richard Walgrave, in whose lands the dragon was lurking, went out to shoot it with arrows, but its body eluded all the shots of the arrows, which rebounded off of its scales as from iron or hard rock. 
and those that fell upon its vertebrae sprang off it, making a ringing sound as if they had struck a bronze plate, and flew from a considerable distance by reason of the impenetrable hide of the beast. It seemed as though the whole country had been summoned to kill it. However, when it saw that it was being attacked with arrows again, it fled into marshland and hid among the reeds, and was never seen again. And it should be said here that Sudbury is a small town in Suffolk on the border with Essex. <laughs> yes. It's not... Well, normally when we talk about monsters, they tend to be at the periphery of the medieval world. This is just near Essex. Yeah. <laughs> Day trip out of London, go and meet a dragon. <laughs> it's Marvel. It's strange. But it's also apparently completely natural. Exactly. There's it nothing is. Yeah. magical really about it. It's a dragon. Yeah, it's yeah, us imposing that upon it, I suppose. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's just sort of mentioned, you know, I mean, it almost reads like a fairy story at the same mm. time. You know, you've got the sort of going and terrorising a lot of sheep and then people not being able to kill it. Um, and then it's sort of hiding among the reeds and never seen again. I mean, that's just a lovely end to a sort of yeah. fairy story. It disappears. Yeah. Poor dragon mm -hmm. somewhere else. Just, Probably hungry without yeah. the sheep. I know. Poor thing. I mean... But that's the thing, it, it's a natural phenomenon which doesn't seem to... Because normally we would expect a chronicle to go, and this was a sign of the devil coming, or, you know, God... Or whilst him doing his normal thing of, and there were many great and terrible things which yes. came later this year as mm -hmm. this portended. But he's done it before, mm -hmm. why not now? Yeah, but this, to me... I'm not saying the dragons exist, I mean, I would love no. it if they do, but Absolutely. this to me suggests that actually when he does reference magic, or he does reference some kind of interesting portent or something, this is something that he's actually observing, and it is something which he believes is happening, and isn't just something he's sort of throwing in because he strongly dislikes someone, or because he wants to find some rhyme or reason. It, because otherwise, every strange appearance would be important, every bad um, situation would have a portent attached to it. That's just not the case. Yes. And we see it in Adam of Usk, hmm. but not in Walsium. Most of these episodes actually disappear in his shorter versions. Hmm. When you get the condensed versions of his chronicle, and these sort of bizarre little beautiful things like a crested dragon, mm -hmm. vanish. Interesting. And I think that that's possibly a sign that it's more about his sort of natural history impulses than about some desire to point out the supposed supernatural in life. It's hmm. not the dragons can't be portents or strange. Mm -hmm. You get examples of dragons in the sky where they're probably comets or just some form of the aurora yeah. and they're associated with one death or another mm -hmm. but not here. No. That's that's apart from the supernatural world and very much mm -hmm. in our own world or at least in Walsium's own world yeah. in a way. Absolutely. And who were we talking about earlier, before the podcast started? So we, we mentioned Joan of Navarre and Alice Perez, who both do have magic associated with oh, that was it. Yeah, so Alice Perez has magic associated with her, obviously, and there have been various different readings of the Alice Perez situation that say that actually the reason that magic was associated with her was because of this fear of witchcraft, and the fact that it's too early for witchcraft is neither here nor there. But it's a disruptive woman who is usurping her place, she's got far too much influence over the king, and that might be why this accusation of magic has been placed on top of her as well. Well, however, Walsingham also, well... Walsingham and Henry Knighton, actually, mm. who I've mentioned before, but um, they talk about Catherine Swint, the mistress and later wife of John of Gaunt. Mm. And in most ways she has the same terrible traits as Alice Perry. She, she's a seducer, she's evil. Henry Knighton rejoices when John of Gaunt temporarily throws her over during the time of the Peasants' Revolt. He has a whole passage about it, but she's not accused of witchcraft or magic mm. by either of them. As far as I'm aware, at any rate. Not that I've gone across. No. So what you would think would be the perfect stereotype, actually, to apply yes. magic to. I suppose one last thing that we can cover is how credulous people were around magic, actually. Yeah. We've already covered that, actually. Yeah. It is something that exists in society, um, and it wasn't necessarily something which was just being thrown around as an insult. And the chroniclers believe that this, this is there, they refer to it. But it is that question, isn't it? Do they just naturally accept it? Is, is everything going to be accepted as magic no matter what? Yes. And the answer I think we both come to really is that no, it wasn't something that just, you know, was accepted uncritically at all times. So Owen Glendower, um, who you mentioned before as the sort of Prince of Wales, depending on who you ask yeah. again, he caused all sorts of problems for Henry the Fourth of England. Again, could have been a rebel, could have been a prince. Last native Welshman to hold the title of the Prince of Wales, in fact. There you go. And he led various different rebellions against Henry IV. And this did 
you know, cause comment among chroniclers and among you know, the wider population. And there's this one section from the Jer... Do you want to pronounce it? I'll fail, but Jer actress? Yeah, let's go with that. Let's Jill go with that. Yeah. Which is an abbey in Cheshire. Moderately far from the Welsh border, as far as you can get really in Cheshire. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but still but definitely closer to Wales than yes. your average, you know, Suffolk. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fairly short uh, chronicle. It's written by Cistercians, and there are two chroniclers. This is the second chronicle who's speaking. He's much more pro Henry IV than the first one, who was much more pro Richard II. In fact, there's a nice interlude in between the two of them where the second chronicler has a go at the first one for his sympathies. <laughs> Which is fun, I just love the idea of chronicles arguing for themselves. But yes, yeah, so there's a section which relates to the rebellion of Owen Glandua, and it says, At this time the English took away many goods, and in particular an almost infinite multitude of all kinds of beasts, so that one would suppose it almost impossible that so many goods, especially animals, could be contained within such a small region. This is during the English sort of invasion of the market. But a miraculous thing, although the season was clear and tranquil, they, i.e. the English, never had pleasant weather when they were there before going back. But there was an inundation of thunders, hail, and especially in the summer season. But it does not seem difficult for this to occur through sorcery, that, that it is supposed to have happened through Owen's magicians, and it is not impossible for the air to be moved through the power of unclean spirits. But, to many discerning people, it seems that the cause of the said tempest was principally that the aforesaid people had no just title against them, thus they almost always failed in their plans, and too often laboured in vain. Now, there's a lot of they's in that section, which yes. kind of makes it a little bit hard to understand. Perhaps we should just clarify that yeah. the basic principle is that the Welsh are using magic against the English to make the weather substantially worse and thwart their campaign. Yes, and this is actually mentioned in a couple of other chronicles, isn't it? This yes. idea that Owen was um, using magicians yes. in that way. As it was Thomas Walsingham, notably. Mm. But, Julaka. <laughs> also, sorry, I should also say in a later 15th century chronicle, which mm. includes that Owen is using a magical amulet to make himself invisible through yes. a lot of this. Mm -hmm. Again, we're playing into the magical artifacts mm. type idea. It is, and it's also it's kind of almost playing into the sort of will of the wisp idea as well as yes. it's sort of you know somebody disappearing into the fog essentially and becoming a dangerous sort of nature yes. spirit or something like that. But it's being interpreted here as active magic and not something natural or spirit yes. based. I guess it, it's very fancy, isn't it? Oh, mm. the magicians calling down thunder and lightning from the heavens yes. upon the. You can just imagine it being Gandalf in Wales, yes. can't you? It's it is. Pretty... It's. It's almost exactly Gandalf and Saruman having a battle over mm. Caradras. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, God knows where Tolkien got it from, but there you go. No. <laughs> um, Good old medievalists. Oh, I know. <laughs> Tolkien. Oh. Oh. Um, but no, so the interesting part, though, is that the Julaka Chronicle doesn't say that this is impossible. In fact, it says it's not impossible for the air to be moved through the power of unclean spirits. However, he says that Owen didn't use them. He says that to many discerning people, the Tempest was actually brought about by the English not having the right to be there, essentially, and attacking without just cause. Which actually plays into that aspect. That's the English defying, effectively, the natural order. God's mm. established order. Yes. It's almost, from what you said earlier, mm -hmm. magical, mm -hmm. but not humans doing the magic. Okay. It's miraculous rather than magical. In Absolutely. A sense. And, and his, his, his distinction here really highlights the sense that they aren't uncritical writers. They're mm -hmm. really, they're, they're clearly thinking about these things. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily come to the same conclusions that we might today, yep. but they are engaging. Mm -hmm. They're not just accepting, they are genuinely taking these events and trying to understand them within a different worldview. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, people tend to think of magic as irrational. It's not. It's inherently rational, actually. You just need to be living in the right Wittgensteinian language game, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> just to make this, you know, unnecessarily complicated. It makes sense in the world you're living in. Even today, people will get on a plane and they'll carry their lucky, I don't know, sock, yeah. whatever with them. It doesn't need to be approached uncritically. And as we see from this chronicle, there is an acceptance that magic exists, but it, it doesn't need to be used all the time. It isn't need, used to explain, you know, random things that people don't understand. It's actually something which is a part of the world, but only a part of it. And can be thwarted. Mm, absolutely, yeah. And you can, you know, you've got counter magic and magic. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, <clears throat> in some cases, as with the duel, you can just say, make sure you've taken your amulets off before you compete. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Or make sure you take your amulets off before we execute you. Yes. 
I, that is the most unbelievable thing about the Tom, Thomas Favent mm. section is that he that Tresellian goes well I've got a magical object on me I can't die while it's still there <laughs> yes but you can just take it off yep, <laughs> yep. that's uh, yeah. possibly a bad decision on his part really yeah I'm not sure why he mentioned it to be honest no no I think that might be one of the instances where I think that that didn't happen or mm. that maybe they stripped him. Yeah. But the Chronicler may be imposing a reason onto why they stripped him, not onto why he couldn't die. Yeah, that's very possible. And also he was a very boastful man, wasn't he? So it might even be like, even on the scaffold, he was still boasting about how <laughs> his influence and again undermining him. Yeah, definitely flags up that he was evil. Beyond a doubt. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, if you've got demons in your pocket, then you must be, right? There's not many other conclusions to draw from that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> Think. Well, uh, shall we just sort of say goodbye? I suppose so. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah. <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> Bye. The producers of History Chat were Henry Marsh and Tabitha Stanmore. It was brought to you with the kind support of the South, West and Wales Doctoral Training Partnership and the Digital Humanities Lab at the University of Exeter.